coming on now, I think. Yes, we are getting recorded. All right, then, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, welcome to the uh, sessions that we would be having on John's Gospel and also the epistles. Um, in the chat over here in the side, I will try to pay attention to that. But sometimes I get so involved in the session that you know I may not uh, notice what is being typed. Uh, but when we have our break, uh, you know, we would be having a 10-minute uh, break, right? So at that time, I will make sure that I, you know, um, take note of everything that has been posted in the chat uh, because you might have posted even some of your questions, and I want to make sure that I answer all of those. All right, so um, um, we will generally have a 10 minute um, you know, um, break at the very end where you can ask any questions that you have regarding the session that has been covered. Uh, but then in the meantime, also, if you would like to post anything you know, in the chat section, uh, that should be all right. Only I may not be able to, uh, while I'm speaking, I may not really note down what is you know, there in the site. All right. Um, now coming to the uh, introduction to the Gospel of John, uh, which is what we will begin with. Uh, we will talk maybe briefly about the authorship. Uh, I just have a small PowerPoint here, just one slide, uh, with a kind of summary of all the things that we would be uh, you know, hopefully covering today. Uh, that will give you an idea of what is planned uh, for today. If you just give me a moment, let me share this. Now, let me know if this is, uh, you know, showing up on your screens or not. Um, is it uh, visible to all of you? Perfect. All right. Um, just a minute. I'm still a bit new to this, and I'm trying to learn Google Classroom. Um, all right. So yeah, this is what we would be covering. Uh, we would look at the authorship, uh, also from where uh, the author has written this particular gospel. Uh, we'll also see how um, uh, copies were made of this particular gospel and sent out. Uh, what are the areas, regions that this uh, gospel initially covered? Um, so uh, these are hopefully some of the things that we would uh, look into today. Um, getting back to video mode. OK. Um, now, um, there's been debate in the recent past on the authorship of the John's Gospel. Uh, this was not really an issue that anybody even you know, uh, had any controversy regarding. But it's only in the recent past that some scholars began to say, oh, that maybe it's somebody else who wrote John's Gospel. And maybe it was not John himself, because he doesn't name himself in the Gospel. Rather, in John's Gospel, he just uh, refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. And so just recently, some people have uh, brought up a controversy saying that the one whom Jesus loved, uh, was it really referring to John or was it referring to some other uh, disciple? Okay, So that's, that's just a small uh, controversy that has come up in the recent uh, uh, past. But um, down the ages, uh, no one has really doubted the, uh, the author as being John. OK, so uh, John's authorship of this gospel is not really something that is um, contended you know, uh, by people. Uh, now, um, why can we be so sure that this person who refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved, how can we be very sure that this refers specifically to John himself? Um, that's because you know when we look at the uh, references where uh, this term is used, uh, we notice that it could not possibly be Peter because uh, Peter and the one whom Jesus loved are mentioned together. So if both of them are being mentioned together in the same verse, uh, then um, obviously it cannot be Peter. It has to be someone else. Uh, 
Um, and uh, I'll just give you a few of those references. Uh, if we were to look at John chapter 13, verses 23 to 25, uh, we see over there uh, that the one whom Jesus loved uh, communicates with Peter. So both of them are seated over there. So obviously it's not Peter who is being called the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, then coming to another reference, uh, when we look at chapter 20, John chapter 20, verses 2 to 4, again we see that the one whom Jesus loved, uh, he, he goes racing towards the tomb you know, to, uh, to examine it. And he is along with Peter on that occasion as well. So obviously it is not Peter who is being referred to by that particular term. Then uh, if we were to look at John chapter 21, verses 20 to 23, uh, again over there we see that um, Jesus was walking uh, with um, uh, Peter and the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, so based on all of this, we can be pretty sure that Peter is not the one who has written this particular gospel. Um, and then uh, the other uh, possibility which some people suggest is that maybe this author, uh, maybe he is James. But then uh, it cannot be James because in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, we learn that um, James uh, was martyred. And uh, this gospel was written much later, uh, um, uh, years later after the martyrdom of James. And so uh, it cannot be James either. Uh, so um, now, based on this, the argument by most scholars is that John himself must have written this gospel. Now, um, coming to some details regarding John, uh, in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 40, it talks about uh, some disciples who approach Jesus for the first time. Um, um, and uh, if maybe if we could actually look at that, uh, John chapter 1. And if maybe one of us could just read out uh, probably verses 35. Um, okay, maybe we can just read uh, John chapter 1, verses 38, uh, 39, and 40. Could I have one person read out, please? John chapter 1, uh, verses 38, 39, and 40. You could maybe just you know, unmute yourself and uh, if you could read out. Shall I read, ma'am? Shall I read, ma'am? Am I audible? Yes, you are, ma'am. OK. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 38. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. I'm unable to hear at all. So it might be um, something that I would need to reset later. Um, but yeah, at least for today, no one would be audible at all to me. Um, so, yeah, we'll probably not have any uh, verse reading today. Um, it may just be some technical error in my system. So, yeah, I'll have it. I'll figure it out later. Uh, but, yeah, uh, uh, could could I just have maybe one person responding and telling me, could the others hear, uh, you know, even as uh, we had uh, Emmanuel reading it out, could the others, was it audible what was being read out? Could the rest of you hear what was being said? Yes. Okay, yeah, fine. Heard. Then in that case, definitely there must be some um, defect in my system, which I would need to reset. 
all right i will i will take care of that later um okay so yeah based on uh, you know uh, these verses which we just read now it says in verse 40 one of the two who heard um john speak and follow him um one of the two who heard john speak and followed him was andrew simon simon peter's brother so we we get to know in this verse that andrew was one of the persons who heard uh, what the john the baptist was saying and followed jesus it does not name the other person and generally tradition uh, says that it was probably uh, john the, the disciple john who is probably the other person who followed on that particular day so it was probably andrew and john who heard the words of john the baptist and uh, chose to come and follow jesus on that particular day also uh, tradition says that um, when we look at john chapter 18 uh, verses 15 and 16 where it talks about this particular disciple who uh, seemed to know the high priest personally and because of which you know he was able to gain access inside the courtyard uh, you know along with peter so they say that this person uh, who is being being referred to uh, was probably john once again so in john chapter 18 verses 15 to 16 where we have uh, uh, a person who is personally acquainted with the high priest uh, they say that it was most probably john who was that uh, person also um, we of course know that um, it was john who stood at the you know uh, foot of the cross during this uh, crucifixion process um, and it was to him that uh, jesus says that uh, you know commands him and say asks him to take care of uh, his mother so uh, all of these things also seem to verify the fact that the one whom jesus loved the one who refers to himself as the one whom jesus loved uh, um, is probably john himself now um, apart from these mm, biblical uh, evidence regarding the authorship of uh, john's gospel uh, we also have uh, some church historical figures who confirm that this particular gospel was written by john himself now one of the early church fathers uh, was somebody named polycarp now uh, you might be familiar with this polycarp was in fact a disciple they say of john uh, so um, john was mentoring a lot of people and uh, they say that one of the persons that he mentored personally was this church leader named polycarp and uh, polycarp when he wrote out you know his writings and his teachings he in fact um, uh, qu quotes uh, first john the entire uh, passage you know you know that passages from first john he quotes them in his own work because he was a disciple of john and he clearly says that uh, it was John who wrote this particular gospel. And also, apart from Polycarp, uh, during his time, there was another person named Papias, uh, or maybe Papias, not sure of the pronunciation. Uh, and uh, even Papias also says that uh, this particular gospel was written by John himself. Uh, we also have Irenaeus, uh, who is, in fact, one of the more popular you know, church fathers of that time. Uh, and uh, he wrote his work in uh, 280 and um, uh, he clearly says that john was living in ephesus at that particular time when he wrote this particular gospel um, apart from that we also have um, some um, people who wrote some not very accurate uh, doctrinal works they they wrote they wrote works which um, contain some uh, false doctrines. But then in, in their works, they do mention the fact that uh, the writer of this particular gospel was John. So when we have so many sources all very clearly saying that John is the writer, uh, it really does not make sense why uh, in the recent past, some scholars have brought up this controversy uh, just to kind of cast a shadow on the scriptures uh, so we do not need to take these things seriously uh, we can be very uh, sure very confident 
that uh, this gospel was very much written by John, and it is important for us to you know um, to 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 establish the 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 integrity of this fact because uh, John says that he was a witness, right? Um, now, where would we have that? Um, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. And uh, yeah, as I cannot really hear from other people, uh, maybe, you know, I can just uh, read out. Uh, and it says over here, the word became flesh, you know, John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son. So over here, uh, so very clearly, um, you know, uh, this writer of John is saying, we have seen his glory. So this person is saying, I have personally testified, I'm personally testifying that I have witnessed this Jesus with my own eyes. I have heard his words. I have spoken to him. And uh, so, you know, if we have some um, uh, scholars coming along and saying, no, 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 this must be some stranger who wrote uh, this gospel down the line, you know, who probably never even had any personal contact with Jesus. That would just um, dilute the importance of this gospel. So when anyone comes up with such arguments, we should be able to, you know, present this evidence to them and prove that this uh, gospel was written by someone who had literally interacted with Jesus you know, on a daily basis, had spoken to him, had seen him, had witnessed the things which Jesus did. So these are not just uh, uh, things that uh, were concocted much later in some, you know, latter century, but rather it, these things were written down by someone who was an eyewitness of these, um, uh, of these very uh, different things. Uh, also, there is um, archaeological, uh, you know, um, accuracy in the in abc in the things written by in this particular gospel uh, because uh, he refers to uh, this pool of bethesda and um, for a long time uh, there were scholars who were arguing and saying oh i think this pool of bethesda is just a mythical story uh, because uh, archaeology has not been able to uh, find any such pool but then again uh, you know in the recent past uh, archaeologists have been able to uncover it and uh, it says over there if you look at that particular passage which talks about the pool of bethesda it talks about how there were five colonnades and that's exactly uh, what we see in the archaeological find you know which has been uncovered now there are five colonnades exactly the way uh, you know uh, john has described it also uh, uh, he uh, john makes reference to many other things he talks about Solomon's portico, and he talks about the um, Pilate's um, uh, 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 praetorium and all of that. And all these references uh, are, are backed up by archaeology. So these are all things uh, which were seen and witnessed by uh, the writer. Um, and, uh, it, it, and all these, uh, because you see, some of these buildings were uh, destroyed after the fall of Jerusalem. So this person who has uh, walked around Jerusalem and seen all these things uh, was someone who was uh, alive and uh, moving about before the fall of Jerusalem, before AD 70 itself. So uh, this kind of false claim that John's gospel was written much later uh, in, in one of the latter centuries is a very, very false claim because here is a person who's describing all these spots which he has seen with his own eyes and which he records about in his uh, in his gospel. And all of this is evidence that um, this was written by John and he was um, living in that place. He saw those places with his own eyes and he mentions them by name in his uh, gospel. Coming to the uh, second thing, uh, the place of writing. Uh, we, we have uh, a lot of uh, historians, uh, church historians um, in the, you know, belonging to the very early centuries, all of them saying that John was most probably living in uh, Ephesus at that time. Uh, Eusebius is one of the, um, one of the first church historians who wrote out his uh, you know, historical record of all that happened in the early church. Uh, so Eusebius, he talks about how um, John was living in Ephesus at that time when he wrote out this particular gospel. Uh, we have uh, Irenaeus once again who mentions the same fact. 
uh, this um, um, there's a bishop named Polycrates. Now, bishop was the um, uh, Polycrates was the bishop of Ephesus in uh, 190 AD. So, uh, in the early church, uh, they had leaders, and some of the leaders were called bishops. And uh, Polycrates was one of them. And uh, he says that while John was living with them in Ephesus, uh, he wrote out this particular gospel. Uh, there's also an interesting reference that we see in the uh, in something called the Muratorian Canon. Okay, now the Muratorian Canon is um, uh, um, is a writing uh, not very trustworthy when it comes to doctrine, uh, but in that canon there is mention made that um, um, Paul. Uh, it says over there that John was urged by his friends. Uh, to write down a gospel with all the details of all that had occurred during the time of Jesus. Okay, so um, in this canon, can that information be found in the early church writings? So yeah, in fact, if you were to go, um, I don't know whether the, these things are available freely on the internet, but if you were to actually go into uh, English translations of these works, uh, we would, in fact, see references uh, you know, uh, pointing out that um, uh, John wrote while he was living in Ephesus and references like that, we would in fact see it. So, uh, because now a lot of these ancient monographs have been posted online and they are available for us to view. Uh, so, um, these are all uh, things which have been backed up, uh, you know, uh, um, with proof. So, um, so yes, it may, there is there is every chance that if you were to really hunt down the Muratorian canon, uh, and if you could find the, a monograph of that online, uh, there would be these references, you know, in it. So um, in this Muratorian canon, the writer, whoever you know, who, who wrote that canon, he said that he was, that John it seems was urged by his friends to write down a written record of um, all that had occurred, and. Uh, we see an indirect reference to this in John chapter 21, verse 24. Um, again, let me just read out because um, I don't seem to have access to have to sound. Uh, so John 21, 24. Just a minute. Uh, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. Okay, so um, up to verse 23, uh, we have uh, John writing down a whole bunch of things, and now over here in verse 24, someone is confirming, affirming, and they are saying, you know, this is the disciple who is testifying. And so they say that it's probably the elders of Ephesus who are confirming at the very end of this gospel. They are uh, confirming and saying all these things which have been written down so far, they have been written down by this disciple. And we, the elders, are confirming that well, no, what he has written down over here uh, is, is something that has been uh, testified um, accurately. So uh, there's a reference to that. And uh, so they, you know, they emphasize the fact that uh, it says over here, and we know that his testimony is true. So there are people who have uh, seen what he has written, and now they are confirming and saying, you know, we have also, we, some of us have witnessed these things with our own eyes, and so we can back up what is being recorded over here in this gospel, and we confirm that whatever is being said over here, this testimony is true. Um, now, coming to this, this chapter 21, uh, it is generally said that this may be a, uh, a kind of later, uh, slightly later addition. Probably originally, John, when he wrote down the gospel, he stopped with John chapter 20, because the ending of John chapter 20 uh, sounds like a very uh, clear conclusion. And then later on, uh, maybe one or two years later, uh, they say that he probably added chapter 21 just to clarify some uh, extra things. Um, that's generally what is said by scholars regarding this particular um, thing. 
now um, yeah maybe we can uh, talk about how it was written out and uh, how it was circulated uh, yeah mm -hmm. now in the uh, in those days uh, writing was not something that was very uh, commonly undertaken uh, because uh, for generations they had been used to the oral tradition and so uh, when an important teacher uh, would come into their towns and villages and teach, uh, and if, if they really valued what was being said, uh, there would be people who would literally memorize uh, entire chunks of that teaching. And then they would go from village to village, you know, um, uh, communicating what they have heard and what they have learned what they have memorized so uh, in this way in the initial stages uh, even all of these things which jesus was teaching um, his followers you know his 12 disciples as well as the others would have memorized um, entire chunks of this and they would have gone from place to place uh, transmitting it communicating it and then later uh, john would have actually sat down and written down in written form the things which you know had been orally memorized by him and by the others uh, so um, it's the same even with the old testament you know i mean uh, in the in the very beginning all the genealogies and all those poems and songs and all of those passages which we see in genesis they would have been uh, memorized by hearted and then later at some point of time moses would have sat down and he would have put it all down into writings that future generations would have a record of it. Uh, so we see this uh, even here in the New Testament, uh, where most probably initially, Jesus' disciples would have just uh, by hearted all that was being uh, taught by uh, Jesus. And uh, so it would have been oral communication in the very beginning. And then uh, later, uh, John would have put, put down these things in uh, writing. So. Um, we see that um, when you know Irenaeus in his Irenaeus, the church historians uh, historian, he says that John published. He, he uses the term published. He says that John published his gospel. Now that was a term that was used in those days when something is being uh, produced on a on a mass scale. Okay, so uh, what do I mean by that? Um, when an important work was written out, uh, there would be people who would be hired to make copies of it. So it's not just one single copy going out, uh, but uh, the that particular original writing would be published in the sense there would be many, many copies of it made and uh, it would be distributed you know, in different uh, regions. So in that sense, uh, what they say is that John probably uh, published this particular gospel, uh, because uh, near the town of, um, near the city of Ephesus, uh, there was this large um, library at Pergamum, I think. It says somewhere in my notes. Not particularly sure where I put it. But yeah, I think it was somewhere in Pergamum that there was this large uh, library where you would have all these scribes. Scribes are the people who have really good, neat handwriting, I suppose. And they would write down, they would uh, make copies of the original. And uh, so uh, uh, they say that John also probably you know, uh, took his gospel there. And uh, they would have made many, many copies of that. And these copies were then sent out to um, different places. And just a minute, I seem to have lost track of my notes. Just a minute, please. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that, that's correct. All right. Uh, so John, uh, when he presents his gospel, he uh, begins by talking about the word, right? right in the very first chapter. Uh, John begins by talking about the word and um, he presents the word not just as something written but as a living person who comes down and um, 
not only speaks but acts out all that god wishes to communicate so he so jesus becomes the word uh, jesus not just not becomes jesus is the word who chooses to come down and uh, he uh, reveals through his words and his lifestyle and his actions and his choices uh, all that god wishes to reveal about himself so uh, there's a great emphasis in the gospel of john on uh, the word as uh, not just uh, written as something that is written down but also as uh, something that which was lived out and so in his gospel john hopes to um, to make a record of all these things that jesus expressed both through his words and through his actions and through his lifestyle and um, the emphasis throughout is not just to give a kind of historical record of what took place but to bring out the spiritual insights uh, the spiritual teachings the things uh, which go beyond just a historical record so when we are looking at this uh, gospel of john we would not just see it as a a historical document which it definitely is it is a historical document but we would also see it as a document of faith it is meant to uh, help people believe in jesus and it is meant to uh, help them to imitate him and uh, you know to be a true follower of jesus uh, so that would be the main um, uh, focus of this particular uh, gospel and um so uh, what um, the what has been mentioned in the records is that uh, you know in av this this church historians where they have talked about how this uh, john's gospel was um, was distributed uh, to various places uh, they they keep referring to it as a uh, codex uh, that's supposed to be the term that they have uh, used and uh, so what do they mean by a codex um, by that time uh, they were no longer using long scrolls but they were using a uh, papyrus right uh, so uh, john's gospel when uh, he was writing down he probably would have used a scribe um, maybe he wrote it himself we do not know but then you know he might have dictated it to a scribe because the scribes specialized in handwriting they were uh, taught how to write in a particular style which would be very clear uh, very um, you know uh, easy for the readers to read and so he probably would have just dictated it to a scribe and the scribe would have done the actual writing down and uh, it would have originally been written on a papyrus uh, which were uh, which was a kind of very ancient paper uh, so these uh, sheets of papyrus would have been stitched together um, and uh, they would have been attached to one um, uh, to a wooden spine you know that's basically how uh, those ancient books were created uh, how they were uh, formatted so all this uh, all these papyri or uh, all these pages would be stitched together uh, to one single spine uh, to a to a wooden spine which which would hold the whole thing together so these code they were called papyr papyrus codexes and so these codexes uh, were sent out uh, throughout the region of um, asia at that time asia minor throughout the region of asia minor at that time um yeah um May some of these uh, codexes, uh, I mean, some of these manuscripts have, I mean, exist even today. Uh, and um, there are two of them which are just technically called P5 and P75. Um, and uh, so these P5 and P75, these two papyrus codexes, uh, they contain 20 chapters only. But then you have other manuscripts which contain the 21 chapters, which is why, you know, like I said earlier, um, it is believed that in the first edition, John probably just finished with chapter 20 and sent out his uh, codexes. And then later he wanted to add some additional details. And when we are 
when we are going through this uh, chapter by chapter, and even as we are making a study verse by verse, uh, we will look at the significance of the 21st chapter. So we will uh, talk about that later. But just for us to know right now, uh, we have copies where we have uh, only uh, the text being written up to chapter 20. And also there are manuscripts which, which exist today, which we have copies, you know, which we have today, where you have the uh, 21st chapter added on. Uh, so we have both uh, types of manuscripts available to us even now. Uh, yeah. Uh, at this point, yeah, if, if I would just like to pause for a few minutes, um, is there any any doubt or any question at all that anyone would like to raise? Um, it says your page number, uh, page number of what? Uh, if And I cannot hear you because I don't seem to have audio. Let's see if you could, you know, type it out. Um, it says page number. So I just want to know, I mean, uh, uh, are you referring to the uh, the text book which was posted? Uh, because uh, this introduction, I mean, it's just an introduction. It's not uh, in the text book. So I, I'm assuming that that was the question. Um, so uh, whatever I have been talking about today, it's just an introductory session, uh, just to give an introduction to the Gospel of John. Uh, so. Um, these are not things which are mentioned in your textbook as such. So I'm assuming that that was that was what Asha Rani was referring to. Um, okay, there don't seem to be a, any other questions. But uh, would anyone like to raise any question at this point of time, just regarding this background of this gospel and uh, how it was recorded and anything at all that we were, you know, any doubts regarding the things that we were talking about. It would be, of course, convenient if I could just hear you and. Uh, um, Is it audible, Pastor? But if you could type out your question just for today. It, Next time onwards, I'll make sure that my Am I audible? audio is working because today it isn't. I'm so sorry, Shri Kumar. I mean, I can see that, you know, I can see the. Uh, icon blinking over there, but then I cannot hear you. Uh, I'm not able to get any audio over here. Would it be, if it's a brief question, could you, you know, just type it out? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, anyone else who would like to raise any question? Maybe we can just you know move on to the next section then. And uh, yeah, if if possible, uh, yeah, Shri Kumar, if you could you know type out the the question which you had, and then I can answer it. And next time onwards, I I mean we'll fix the audio so that I'll be able to hear everyone. Okay, so uh, we will look at the circulation of John's Gospel. Um, So uh, initially, when uh, uh, we see that the Gospel of John was sent out throughout Asia Minor, and um, um, in the beginning, it was just these four Gospels which were individually being distributed throughout uh, that entire region. And then uh, later, I, it was third century onwards, that we see uh, all the four Gospels joined together as one single collection and being sent out. But in the first century and the second century, uh, we see that they were just simply distributed as individual copies, as individual uh, gospels. And it was only later that they were compiled into one in, into one single section as four gospels. And um, we have quotations from John's gospel found in uh, the works of many people, um, just to name a few. We have uh, these are the more popular names, okay? Origin and Clement of Alexandria, and uh, a 
an, a, a historian named Tertullian and Hippolytus and also the Bishop of Sardis, Melito. All of these people, they all quote uh, John in their uh, writings. So which means that um, the Gospel of John uh, was distributed and spread to all these different regions where these people were living. All of these names that I mentioned, they were people located in different parts of the Mediterranean region. And all of them are quoting from John's gospel, which means that uh, the, uh, the, the, this gospel reached all of them. Um. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, there, are, there are some um, comments here. OK, this one um, question here. Is there any possibility of error um, by the scribes? And then uh, after that, could you shed more light on codex? OK, I think now that these things are showing up in the chat. They were not showing up earlier. Um, OK, let's go back to the first question. Uh, which was possibility of error. Now, uh, we do see variations in spelling. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you were to look online, you would, uh, there are uh, websites where you literally have every single variation of spelling mentioned. So uh, sometimes there were errors made by the scribes uh, when it came to um, a spelling mistake. but we don't find any uh, we don't find entire sentences changed we do not see that occurring anywhere so there are variations in spellings sometimes they would leave out a verse I mean, a word not verse so very sorry they would leave out one word by mistake um, that also has occurred and sometimes they would repeat a word you would have one, the same word being repeated twice so that kind of copyist errors, what they call copyist errors, when the when in, during the process of hand, uh, you know, uh, copying by hand another new um, uh, copy of the original. So while that was going on, there were copyist errors which occurred in the form of spelling mistakes, in the form of a uh, word being dropped out accidentally because they, you know, they did not notice it, or sometimes words would be repeated. The same word would be repeated twice that kind of a thing, but an entire sentence being changed in all the manuscripts that we have in, you know, today available to us today, which are still existing, which have not been you know, destroyed or deteriorated. Um, when we compare all of those, we notice only these kind of small errors. We have not observed any, um, an entire sentence being changed uh, somewhere. So that kind of major errors, uh, are have not been noticed at least not so far so the scribes would have uh, been quite careful uh, in doing their work um, 